Welcome to episode four of What's Ruining Your Bird Photography. In these videos, we talk about different issues and mistakes we might make in the field as bird photographers that might be ruining our images. The first one I wanna talk about is one that all photographers experience and it's unwanted motion blur. Usually this happens when our subject moves a little bit too fast for our shutter speed or our camera shakes while we're taking a photo. And the results from this could be blurriness on a larger scale, like the entire bird is out of focus or blurry or it could be a little bit more minor where you have just the bird's eye that's a little bit soft. But either way, whether it's the entire bird or just the part of the eye, it's frustrating and it definitely can ruin the entire image. So the easiest way to fix this is to just increase our shutter speed. So that'll freeze any of the movement or the action that's happening in the scene while also being able to compensate for any camera shake that might happen while we're taking the photos. And I know we're not always in the best conditions to be able to push these shutter speeds higher and higher because we will be raising our ISO and possibly introducing a lot of noise into the image. But at the end of the day, it's better to have a sharp image with a bit of noise rather than a blurry image with no noise. Some of the other things that might help reduce motion blur, especially at those lower shutter speeds, is to use a support like a tripod, a monopod, or if you're in the field and you don't have those things, you can lean up against a tree branch, you can lean against a rock, whatever you can do safely to stabilize your camera and stabilize your lens, that'll definitely help in reducing those images that have a lot of motion blur. I'd also suggest turning on lens stabilization if your lens does have that option. And lastly, one of my favorite techniques to use at slower shutter speeds to kind of increase my odds at getting a sharper photo is to take longer bursts of images. So instead of just taking one or two images, I'll take a burst of five or 10, and that'll kind of increase the odds that one of those photos is tack sharp. If you do want some more tips and techniques on using slow shutter speeds, I do have a video on my channel where I talk about it a little bit more in depth. So you can go check that out in the info card above. The next mistake is one that's done in the editing process and that's over cropping. With all these new high megapixel cameras coming out, it's getting more and more common for us to do these really deep crops in our images. But even though we have these extra megapixels to hack away, there is a tipping point where the photo becomes unusable. And that tipping point kind of depends on a few factors, but ultimately comes down to the photographer's personal preference. Two people can take the exact same photo, but both have very different ideas of how much is acceptable to crop off. To avoid cropping, photographers will use longer lenses, teleconverters, or try to get closer to their subject to get the best image quality possible. And that's the biggest downside to overcropping is that there is a loss of detail in the image. But there are other issues that come with overcropping. For one, the heavier the crop, the more noticeable some of the imperfections in the image might be. So if we take something like motion blur, where there might be a little bit of blur in the bird's eye, if you're looking at that full image, it may not be as noticeable, but once you start cropping in, those little imperfections become more and more noticeable to the viewer. And this applies to noise as well. The more we crop, the more noticeable and distracting noise becomes. And if we're cropping instead of using a longer lens or a teleconverter or trying to get closer to our subjects, we're also losing subject isolation, which means more of the background and the foreground will be in focus, which could make for more of a distracting image. Now, I'm not saying that cropping is bad, whether it's a small amount to fix our composition or if it's a lot because we couldn't get close enough to our subject, I think cropping does have its place in bird photography, but it is something to be conscious about when you're in the field, especially when sometimes we can't get close enough to our subjects, whether there's a physical barrier or whether there's an ethical barrier. We don't want to just get as close as we possibly can because we want the best image quality. We need to kind of weigh out the options and make sure we're doing what's best for the wildlife. And sometimes that's just not getting close enough and cropping in post. So what do we do if we're in a situation where we're already using a longer lens, a teleconverter, and we're as close as we can get, and we'd still have to do a heavy crop to get the composition we want? I would suggest one of two things. For one, just choose a different composition that does work from your position. So if you're further out and you can't get those frame filling shots, try to find something else that works in the area. Otherwise, if that doesn't work either, I would suggest to just move on and find a different subject because there's no reason to try to force an image and potentially scare off your subject just because you wanted a frame filling shot. The next issue that might be ruining our bird photography is rushing our approach. And I know it might be difficult sometimes because we never really know how long the bird's gonna sit still for. So we get that sense of urgency and that sense of we need to get a photo now before that bird takes off. But ultimately rushing our approach is what's gonna push the bird further and further away. So when you are approaching a bird, I do have a few suggestions. First off, get your camera ready as early as possible. Whether that's your tripod off your shoulder and opening it up, whether it's just lifting up your camera, these movements, although they might seem minor, can definitely scare away a bird when you're in close. 
I also suggest as you're moving be as quiet as possible look for any branches that you might step on or make sure you're not getting snagged on any trees that might start shaking and also move slowly and avoid taking a direct path to the bird because sometimes when we're walking head on too fast a bird could take that as a sign of threat or potential danger and they'll just fly off so those are the few things that I'm taking into consideration when I'm walking towards a bird but it doesn't work 100% of the time. Some birds are very skittish. So there's another technique that I like to use that I think works even better. And that's to just position yourself in an area where you think the bird's gonna come to you. By observing the bird a little bit, seeing what it's doing, where it's going, how it's moving, we can sometimes put ourselves in a position where the bird's gonna come to us. And this doesn't work 100% of the time, but when it does, it could lead to some pretty great photos because the bird is willingly coming into our space and it means they've either accepted us or they think we're a part of the surroundings and it could lead to some better photo opportunities. An example of where I really like to use this technique is with shorebirds. Instead of just heading to a beach and heading directly for the flock, what I like to do is observe them for a bit, see how they're moving along the beach and then just position myself somewhere where I know they're gonna to come to me and by doing this I usually get better photos the birds usually come in closer and they're a little bit more comfortable with me so it's a win-win it's good for the photographer it's good for the subjects and it's also a great way to avoid the problem of rushing our approach the next mistake that we might encounter is always relying on autofocus Autofocus systems are getting better and better. Now we even have bird IAF that can recognize and lock onto a bird's eye and track it. It's incredible. But at the same time, even though these autofocus systems are incredibly smart, they don't get it right 100% of the times. Sometimes when we are in a tricky autofocus situation, we will have to jump to manual focus to either assist the autofocus to get it right or to just manually focus on the subject and take those photos ourselves. So being comfortable with manual focus is incredibly important for bird photography because we're constantly dealing with leaves and branches and grasses going in front of our subjects. So knowing how to get to your manual focus and knowing how to use it can be extremely beneficial. What I like to do to make it even easier is to have a custom function button that toggles between autofocus and manual focus. Even though my lens does have a switch where I can toggle this, I find it quicker and more accessible to have a custom function button assigned to control the focus. So that's all I have for you today. Thanks so much for watching. But before I go, I'd just like to thank the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creatives. Their classes cover a ton of topics ranging from photography, videography, editing, lifestyle, freelancing, and much more. If you're new to creating videos, I highly recommend a class called Video for Beginners. Create original and engaging content by Charles Carter. I love that he breaks down and simplifies the different elements that go into a successful and engaging video and he keeps it general enough that these tips can be applied to any niche. Classes just like this are divided into easy to follow lessons with no ads, so you can really just focus on learning. And right now, we're giving away free one month trials of Skillshare premium memberships to the first thousand of my subscribers that join using the link below. So check it out, there's a bunch of amazing learning opportunities, and thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I'll see you in the next one. Happy birding.